Good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions. We start with economy, jobs and fair work. Question number one, Joan McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to support the financial services industry. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, Scotland's financial services sector directly employs 86,000 people across Scotland and also delivers 6.5% of Scotland's GVA. The Scottish Government works in partnership with the financial services sector through the Financial Services Advisory Board to support the sector's continued growth. Our development and skills agencies are actively engaging with the sector and key professional bodies to support development of the sector across Scotland, building on our established global reputation in the industry. In the programme for government, we committed funding of up to £250,000 to establish FinTech Scotland, an independent industry-led organisation backed by public, private and academic partners, which will champion, nurture and grow Scotland's FinTech community. Joan McAlpine. Secretary for that answer. During a recent visit to Dublin by the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee, representatives from the British Irish Chamber of Commerce explained how financial services firms from the UK were already putting in place plans to move jobs to Dublin because of uncertainty with regards to the sector post-Brexit. Given that the UK government has still failed to produce a position paper on the sector for its negotiations on Brexit, does the government believe that this is a danger to Scotland as well as a missed opportunity that we're going to lose these jobs, but if we were still in the single market, we would be well placed to attract them? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I fully agree with the points made by Joan McAlpine, and it's interesting that we are seeing some comments now in relation to the financial sector about passporting no longer being an option, something that was deemed by the sector to be absolutely critical to their continued uh, ability to thrive in the context of a Brexit environment. Uh, and it is the case the UK government should, of course, have produced a detailed proposal for the future relationship with the EU and the implications for the financial sector. We're seeing other countries in the EU quite happily being predators in relation to some of the uh, businesses here in the UK. And, of course, financial firms are already planning for the future, but in the absence of any certainty or any analysis done by the UK government, are having to base their uh, arrangements on a worst-case scenario of a hard Brexit. So continued uncertainty over the UK government's negotiating position risks jobs and future investment in the financial services sector in Scotland and across the UK. And that's not just the Scottish government saying it. Every business organisation, I think today it's the British Chambers of Commerce, but every business uh, organisation, every economic think tank says this. The only people that don't say this, of course, are Scottish Conservatives. Dean Lockhart. Thank you very much. Um, based on the latest available figures, Scotland's finance and insurance trade with the rest of the UK represented 83% of all of this sector's business in Scotland and was worth 20 times the value of Scotland's finance and insurance trade with the EU single market. Given this, what steps is the Cabinet Secretary taking to help the sector protect in Scotland, protect and expand its market with the rest of the UK single market? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, some of the things which I said in my response to Joan McAlpine's uh, first uh, question actually laid out some of the things that we're doing. But it's worth saying in relation, for example, to FISAB, the body which I mentioned, which the First Minister jointly chairs with the industry and which Paul Wheelhouse and myself also attend. Many of those organisations are, as Dean Lockhart suggests, organisations which have a UK presence as well. There's a great deal being done, which is, of course, common to both areas. But there's also the, the question, which people in FISA will also say, uh, of the different perspective, the different demographic, if you like, of the financial sector in Scotland. And you've mentioned some of the funds which are looked after in, uh, in Scotland. So, for example, uh, global custody of funds, the asset management, especially the strength of that in the Scottish economy, does have a different perspective from elements of the financial sector in London. But it's hugely important. It's also the second biggest one uh, by some measures in the, in, in the EU, uh, even greater than Frankfurt. So, of course, it's the case that there is substantial business. And nothing that I've said, or the First Minister said, or Paul Wheelhouse has said, suggests we should do anything other than try to grow that business with the UK. We realise how important it is. It's not us that are looking to be isolationists and cut ourselves off from markets. So we are, will continue to do the work that we can do to grow both our work with the, and our uh, business with the rest of the UK, but also with the rest of the e EU, which is why it's so vitally important we stay within the single market. Question number two, Rachel Hamilton. Trade hubs are expected to open 
Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government has committed to establishing innovation investment hubs in Dublin, London, Brussels, Berlin and Paris as an integral part of wider work with the, across the Scottish Government with our partners and businesses and that's in order to support trade, investment, innovation and intergovernmental relations. The newly established Berlin hub, located close to the Reichstag, is already operational and recently recruited its first member of staff from Scottish Development International. The early focus for the Berlin hub will be to identify early priorities, build networks and establish key relationships. Our operation in Brussels, of course, is in the process of transitioning into a hub from our existing presence in Brussels, where Scotland Europa has been operating for over 25 years, and the Scottish Government EU office since 1999. That transition should be completed by summer and will include a representative of SDI. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The 2016 SNP programme for government said opening the Berlin and Brussels trade hubs was critical to Scotland's economy when they announced way back in October 2006. The 2017 programme for government even stated that the Berlin would, hub would be open in 2017. The Cabinet Secretary has outlined some processing that is in, in the, on the way to getting these hubs open, but actually we haven't seen action and we want to see action because it's, it's important that these hubs are open and we want to see performance targets that currently don't exist for these hubs in Berlin and Paris, which are not yet functionally operational. Can the Cabinet Sec Secretary give us some more detail over these hubs, please? Cabinet Secretary. Well, perhaps if she listens to the detail I've already provided, she just said that they're not functionally operational. My first answer said the Berlin hub is already operational. I don't know how much more explicit I can be than that. So it is already operational. It's recruited its first member of staff. It, of course, builds on the work that's already done by our presence in Dusseldorf. It builds on the work that was done when I visited Berlin uh, last year. Uh, and also in relation to Brussels, of course, it's a transition arrangement because we have existing presence in Brussels as well. So we, we build on that, which is a rational uh, thing to do. Now, I'm perfectly willing to get into a discussion uh, which is, I think is the first time I've had the question asked by the Conservatives certainly in terms of uh, performance measures for these hubs. I'm perfectly willing to get into that uh, discussion but it is the case that we have done this and of course we've done it in the teeth of substantial opposition from some people but this is important in the context of Brexit. The question that is never asked by the Conservatives what will be the impact of Brexit on the economy in Scotland. The reason why we're doing this building of our presence not just in the EU but also doing it in Canada and other parts of the world as well is because in part of the challenge posed by Brexit, a challenge that at least one Conservative should acknowledge in this chamber. Tom Arthur. The President Officer, this week in an attempt to pacify the hardline Brexiteers in their own party, the Prime Minister ruled out membership of the Customs Union. I've already raised the importance of the Customs Union in this chamber for musicians in Scotland and elsewhere across the UK. Can the Cabinet Secretary state what impacts he thinks leaving the Customs Union will have on Scottish businesses and Scottish trade with European Union countries? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, we think, for example, of course, that being outside the customs union will create barriers to trade for businesses in Scotland and indeed across the UK. So we have consistently made the case that maintaining our membership, both of the single market and the customs union, is essential to the prosperity of Scottish firms and the Scottish economy. Uh, and Scotland's place in Europe, People, Jobs and Investment, which we published last month, demonstrated <coughs> that Brexit will significantly weaken our economy. We have done analysis. We have published analysis. Apparently, the UK government has done some analysis but doesn't want to publish it or tell anybody about it. And yet we get lecture from the Conservative benches about transparency. We have done the work, we've published the work, it's about time the UK government did the same. Question three has been withdrawn. Question four, Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether the Cooper North Relief Road will be funded through the Tay Cities deal. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to securing a city region deal for the Tay Cities as soon as possible and we are currently considering all proposals and fully exploring all financing, uh, financing and funding options. A proposal to accelerate the Cooper Northern Bypass project is one of those put forward by the Tay Cities but it's not possible at this stage for me to confirm details of which projects may or may not be included as part of the final deal. Willie Rennie. Minister for that answer, but the Tay Cities deal aims to create a smarter and fairer region with innovation to create sustainable growth. So I was surprised that the Cooper North Relief Road was put forward as part of this Tay Cities deal, especially when the planning permission specified that the consortium of house builders should be building that road themselves. So why is the state even considering bailing out house builders to build a bypass? And if it comes before them, will he rule it out? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, first of all, he asks why we're considering it. I think I said in my first response, we're considering it because it's the project, the proposal that's come from the relevant local partners, in this case, the local authority. Now, that is the basis of city deals. We, neither we nor the UK government decide the projects which come forward. We do, of course, decide which ones to support. That's perfectly legitimate, but we don't decide. The whole virtue of city deals is that they come from local partners. And I don't know if what Willie Rennie is saying is we should rule these out before we've come to a city deal, before we've come to a conclusion on this, we should rule it out at the very early stage because uh, I think I'm right in the concluding that Willie Rennie doesn't like this. I don't know whether his concerns are related to the, the planning application, but I would make, if, if that is a concern for Willie Rennie, I would make the point that nothing that we do agree in a city deal in any way um, takes away the need for local uh, partners, especially local authorities, to follow whatever statutory processes are involved. And I think it's also worth saying for uh, Willie Rennie's benefit, of course, in relation to the application that he refers to, Sometimes there are other ways to fund these things if that's what's desired. We established, I think when I was Housing Minister back in 2011, a housing infrastructure loan fund to help with infrastructure related to development. So I have asked the officials to make sure that they look at all options for any proposals coming for, forward from local authorities which might unlock further development. But the city deal will be concluded when the local partners ourselves and the UK government are ready to conclude, conclude that deal. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Tay City deal is a fantastic opportunity to bring vital investment into the area and drive economic growth. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on how talks are progressing and does he agree this is an excellent example of benefits brought by cooperation between the UK and Scottish Government? Cabinet Secretary. I do sometimes wonder about that cooperation when I receive letters from, uh, like the one received, uh, I received from the member and his colleagues this week from uh, Conservative members. Uh, we are trying to work very closely with the UK government in relation to this. I think when I and Lord Duncan appeared before the parliamentary committee, uh, the local government committee, that was the first time ministers from both uh, governments had appeared before a Scottish parliamentary committee. And I think if you look at the record from that uh, meeting, you'll see there is a substantial degree of joint working. We are trying to do that. So the idea of unravelling these deals in advance by making announcements, which I think the member asked me to do in the letter that he sent to me, would be disruptive to that joint working. But yes, it is true that we do value very much the fact that the local authorities and partners are the ones that come forward with proposals, and we and the UK government jointly consider and announce at the same time which of these proposals we're able to take forward. I think it's a very valuable process, but we should observe the interest of the different parties involved in it. Question number five, Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that an increasing use of auto automation and artificial intelligence over the next decade will increase employment opportunities in Scotland. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Uh, the Scottish Government recognises the importance of emerging technologies and how they will influence the la future labour market. That's why I published our labour market strategy in August 2016 and why we established the Strategic Labour Market Group to provide advice on a range of matters, including automation and artificial intelligence. In Scotland, we have record levels of employment with a highly skilled workforce. We continue to encourage people to pursue science, technology, engineering and mathematics careers through careers advice and guidance in schools and in the Developing Young Workforce Programme. Through the Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board, we are working to ensure that the planning commission of our annual £2 billion investment in skills is better coordinated and responsive. We continue to support businesses to take advantage of new technologies and advance their ability to integrate with data and digital. We're investing £48 million in the National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland and are providing support for innovation centres such as Census and Data Lab. Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you for that answer. Almost a quarter of jobs in Dundee could be lost to automation by 2030, according to a recent report. At 64.1%, Dundee is already well below the average employment rate, the lowest city of any in the UK. An extra 10,000 jobs are needed just to put Dundee on par with the rest of Britain. Can the minister tell us how he will create these 10,000 jobs and how many new jobs his government have created in Dundee since coming to power? Minister. Uh, well, what I, I can, of course, say is uh, I recognise the report that the member has referred to. I recognise what it has said uh, about the potential impact of uh, uh, increased utilisation of automation. There are, of course, other reports that uh, uh, provide uh, different assessments. Uh, I, I, that said, uh, I recognise there's a lot of uh, good happening in Dundee right now. When I'm there, I'm very pleased to see the investments happening uh, in uh, regeneration, particularly at the uh, waterfront, which is driving uh, an increase in uh, uh, job growth. Uh, indeed, the same report that uh, Mr Bowman has referred to highlights that Dundee shows one of the strongest growth rates 
of private sector jobs. And just a few moments ago, uh, we heard from the, the Cabinet Secretary uh, our commitment to ensure that the Tay Cities regional deal, deal is progressed as soon uh, as is possible. So we're making every effort to ensure that Dundee uh, continues to benefit by uh, the efforts of this government to ensure that people in Scotland have the chance to get into the labour market. And Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Self-drive automated vehicles are a specific technology which will have a significant impact not only on employment profiles and opportunities for industrial innovation, but also on many other areas of public policy, including planning, housing, environmental, energy and regulatory policy. As Parliamentary Liaison Officer for the Economy, I take particular interest in this area. Can I therefore ask what work the Scottish Government plans to do to prepare Scotland for this specific and rapidly approaching technological revolution? Minister. Well, I can assure uh, Mr McKee I take an interest in this uh, matter as well. I think the uh, critical thing for us uh, to do is ensure that not only do we have a, a workforce that's adaptable and ready and uh, responsive to uh, changes in uh, our economy and our labour market, uh, as is likely to be the case through automation, but also that we uh, stand ready to benefit by opportunities uh, as well to make sure that we are uh, not just the consumer of uh, new uh, products and uh, new uh, innovations, but we're also uh, in, an inventor and producer of them as well. That's why uh, we're taking forward uh, uh, development such as the National Manufacturing Institute I've referred to a moment ago, and that's why we've uh, supported innovation in Scotland by uh, increased support for research and uh, development grant funding uh, increased by a total of £45 million pounds over the next three years, uh, an almost 70% uh, 70 increase. Jackie Bailey. Um, whilst I'm sure the Minister um, joins with me in welcoming the opportunity presented by automation, there are understandable concerns about the potential job losses, something like 230,000 Scottish jobs identified by the city's outlook. Um, so can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, what specific forward planning has the Scottish Government done beyond the list um, he's read out? Because I think we would be reassured if he was working with businesses specifically on this issue to mitigate the job losses, but also to create the high-skilled, highly-paid jobs for those who might be displaced. Minister. Well, Ms Bailey can ask the Cabinet Secretary, but I'll answer the question if uh, she, she doesn't mind. Uh, I recognise uh, the points that she... Uh, she ha has made, uh, hopefully in uh, the answers I've given thus far, uh, it gives a sense of the importance in which we are attaching to this uh, area. So I've already referred to the fact that our labour market strategy explicitly recognises uh, the challenges that automation uh, can bring forward. That's why we've established uh, the strategic labour market group. That includes many representatives from industry uh, themselves. We will be willing to engage and discuss uh, with anyone uh, about uh, their perspective on uh, these matters. But of course, uh, we also need to ensure that we have a workforce that is uh, adaptable, and flexible and ready to, to respond to some of the, the challenges and opportunities we have ahead of us. And that's uh, work we take forward through a, a range of initiatives, uh, such as uh, the developing young workforce uh, strategy we have, uh, such as uh, the STEM strategy we've laid out. So we'll continue uh, that work. Kenneth Gibson. Stephen Hawking has said that the emergence of artificial intelligence could be, and I quote, the worst event in the history of our civilization. Will Professor Kevin Warwick of Coventry University attest that networked AI systems cannot be just switched off when they go rogue, a particular problem in military applications where AI is currently being developed? Well, Tesla car maker and space pioneer Elon Musk asserts AI to be as big a threat to humanity as climate change or nuclear war. These views may well be alarmist. However, can the Minister explain what safeguards are being developed in relation to artificial intelligence here in Scotland? Minister. Well, uh, far be it for me to, to disagree with uh, Stephen uh, Hawking, uh, President Officer. Uh, but uh, I, I think um, if Mr Gibson is correct to say that these views may be uh, uh, somewhat alarmist. But I do recognise that this is a, a particular a concern. So it is incumbent on us not only to consider uh, the potential impact on the labour market, but also to hear uh, those uh, concerns. Uh, that's something we'll do by working in conjunction with industry and academia to, to give us a, a full understanding of full uh, future technologies to, to ensure that we ha can make an informed uh, judgment about the move towards the introduction of uh, greater automa automation in uh, the labour market and the introduction of artificial intelligence as well. Question six, Ash Denham to ask the Scottish Government what impact a hard Brexit will have on the Scottish economy. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government published uh, Scotland's Place in Europe, People, Jobs and Investment on the 15th of January, and that assesses the implications for Scotland's economy if the UK exits the European Union. 
and the analysis in that document indicates that a hard Brexit could lead to a loss of up to 8.5% of GDP, or £12.7 billion in 2016 terms, in Scotland by 2030. That's equivalent to £2,300 per individual. Outside of the EU, continued membership of the European Single Market and Customs Union is the least worse option for Scotland and the rest of the UK. And as we move into the crucial second phase of the negotiations, it's time for the UK government to start putting jobs and living standards first and to ensure that the UK position fully reflects all parts of the UK. Ashton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. What is the Scottish Government's reaction to Downing Street's statement declaring that the UK is categorically leaving the customs union? Cabinet Secretary. Well, on the one hand, it's the utter disrespect it shows to the devolved administrations who, by all conventions, should have been involved in discussions around this before that kind of statement was made. But being outside of the customs union will create barriers to trade for businesses across the UK. And that's why the Scottish Government has consistently made the case that maintaining our membership of both the European single market and the customs union are essential to the prosperity of Scottish firms and the Scottish economy. And I thank Ash Denham, Ash Denham for asking the question in the first place. It's a question we will never hear from the Conservatives, nor indeed from Richard Leonard, although we might hear it from Jackie Bailey on occasion. Thank you very much. That concludes our questions on uh, uh, economy, jobs and fair work. We turn now to portfolio questions on finance and constitution. Question number one was withdrawn. So we go to question number two from Patrick Harvey. Signing officer, can I ask the Scottish Government what would be involved in an EU continuity bill in the event that this Parliament does not give legislative consent to the EU withdrawal bill? Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. <coughs> Presiding officer, all parties in this Parliament have agreed with the Finance and Constitutional Committee that the UK's EU withdrawal bill is incompatible with the devolution settlement in Scotland and the Committee's conclusion that the Parliament should not give legislative consent to the bill as currently drafted. In these circumstances, the Government has a responsibility to prepare so that on any scenario there is a legislative framework in place for protecting Scotland's system of laws from the disruption of UK withdrawal from the EU. Michael Russell and Joe Fitzpatrick set out these plans in their letter to the presiding officer on the 10th of January. Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you. I, I note the, the Scottish Government's uh, openness to the possibility that agreement can be reached on changes to the EU withdrawal bill. However, unlikely that prospect seems to be to me. However, uh, Michael Russell, the, the minister responsible, uh, has told the uh, Finance and Constitution Committee that a continuity bill has already been drafted and given to the presiding officer. It's clearly not possible for that to be published until the presiding officer has made a ruling. But surely, if we're to take seriously Mr. Russell's commitment to maximum scrutiny, the Scottish Government is in a position to publish now at least a discussion paper on what the contents of such a bill would be given that we're not going to be in a position to have any kind of meaningful public consultation uh, on such a huge and uh, a far-reaching piece of legislation. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, I'm sure Mr Harvey will understand that uh, the government has to follow the uh, arrangements put in place by Parliament for the proper consideration of bills by the presiding officer, and that is exactly what we have done in this circumstance. I think to help Mr Harvey in relation to the contents of the bill, I think Mr Russell has um, set out very clearly to the committee and his committee appearances the provisions that would be necessary in a continuity bill, as I set out in my original answer, um, to provide um, a framework in place to protect the system of laws um, from disruption as a consequence of UK withdrawal from the European Union. Um, so we, obviously we will consider the point that Mr Harvey has raised about any dialogue. Mr Russell has made clear to committee that the government wants to have the maximum scrutiny of the bill that is possible uh, in the circumstances that prevail. Um, but obviously uh, we'll have to consider that point in the context of the wider discussions we have with the United Kingdom government around the amendment to the EU withdrawal bill. Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank Patrick Harvey for bringing this matter to the attention of the Chamber. I think it's an exceptionally important one. Given that the United Kingdom government has repeatedly committed to amend the European Union withdrawal bill to meet the concerns of the Scottish and Welsh governments, concerns that the Scottish Conservatives have shared, 
And given that negotiations between the United Kingdom Government and the devolved administrations on this matter are proceeding and are making progress, does the Cabinet Secretary not agree with me that introducing a continuity bill into this Parliament at the moment would be unnecessary, premature and unwise? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think what I would uh, encourage Mr Tompkins to reflect on is the um, circumstances and, uh, and scenario that I put to Parliament uh, in my original answer to, um, to Mr Harvey. I said that as things currently stand, and Mr Tompkins is a signatory to this, the France and Constitution Committee have indicated that they could not give legislative consent to the EU withdrawal bill. Uh, I am party to the negotiations with the United Kingdom Government on the amendments to the bill, and I have to say I have a less optimistic assessment of where we are than Mr Tompkins has given to Parliament today. And Mr Tompkins will know that I am very familiar with negotiations with the United Kingdom Government, I am very familiar with coming to agreements on these points, and I am far from optimistic about where we are placed. So in those circumstances, I think the Government in Scotland has a duty to make the arrangements that we have made. We are not doing anything prematurely. We are doing things to ensure that we can protect a framework of stability around the legislation within Scotland if we are unable to give legislative consent to the bill. And as things stand just now, the Scottish Government remains unable to give legislative consent to the EU withdrawal bill. Bruce Crawford. Also grateful to Patrick Harvey for raising this question today. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would, would agree with me that the ball is currently firmly in the court of the United Kingdom Government to respond in the way that the Welsh Government, the Scottish Government, both parliaments, indeed the Conservative Party and the Labour Party in this parliament want them to respond. And that this is quite a clear issue to be resolved. Either you believe in the devolution settlement or you don't believe in the devolution settlement. And it's time that the UK Government expressed in a proper way that they do believe in that settlement and where it stands. Cameron Secretary. The very sharp issue, Presiding Officer, that we <laughs> confront is whether the existing bill, is whether the EU withdrawal bill will be compatible with the devolved settlement. And that is the hard test that has got to be resolved by the negotiations in which we are currently involved. That view has been expressed very powerfully in the House of Lords by Lord Hope, who I think has given um, a very clear assessment of the legislative difficulties that this Parliament would face in signing up to the EU withdrawal bill as it is currently constituted, and has given to the United Kingdom Government a very clear direction as to what amendment has to be made to make that bill compatible, uh, the EU withdrawal bill compatible with the devolved settlement. So I agree with Mr Crawford that that is the sharp issue that the UK Government has got to resolve because um, however much we may wish to get to a point of agreement, we cannot get to a point of agreement that jeopardises the integrity of the devolved settlement, which was legislated for in 1998 and subsequently amended, and which has served this country well. Question three, Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how much financial assistance has been granted to Scottish businesses and in what form, loan, guarantee, equity or other, under the Scottish Growth Scheme? Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Under the Scottish Growth Scheme, Scottish Enterprise continues to assist companies looking to secure investment from the Scottish European Growth Co-Investment Programme. Uh, in the meantime, a total of £25.7 million in equity funding has been agreed and invested in 28 companies under the new and additional resources provided to the existing SME holding fund. And we expect to utilise further European structural funds to expand and enhance the SME holding fund under the Scottish Growth Scheme in 2018. This will support microfinance, debt and equity investment. Liam Kerr. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. When the SNP Government unveiled the Scottish Growth Scheme 18 months ago, it was hailed as a £500 million vote of confidence in the Scottish economy to be made up of loans and guarantees. The scheme is now in the form of equity sold by business and only a fraction of the £500 million assistance to be made available to business in Scotland. So can the Cabinet Secretary confirm when the balance of £500 million will be made available? Camera Secretary. Well, that commitment, in fairness, uh, was made over, uh, well, will be spent over a, and supported over a number of years. And I think some of the deals will take time to conclude because some of it requires investor uh, collaboration as well. So it's not simply a case of people applying for half a billion pounds worth of support, although the commitment is absolutely still there. What we have been able to do, though, is to be quite adept and adapt some of the support 
around what is actually required around commercial financing. I've worked with the banks on this as well and the British Business Bank to ensure that what we can provide is additionality rather than substitute finance. So in that regard, we have worked with other partners and uh, the enterprise agency to ensure that there's a range of support so that we can absolutely deliver on that financial commitment. It will be a variety of measures from equity, loans and guarantees. And I suppose we had first envisaged more use of guarantees, uh, but there seems to be more interest around other areas. That said, of course, we're progressing the plans around the Scottish National Investment Bank and other new measures to be able to support business. And my colleague Keith Brown and his colleagues, ministerial colleagues, will enjoy the 64% uplift mm -hmm. in the economy portfolio in terms of spending and use of financial transactions as well. But I say again, some of these deals will take some time to crystallise. There are other investors involved, but the support is there and we'll work very hard to promote the range of schemes under that umbrella uh, so that we can support our commercial and business community. Question four, Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Finance Secretary has had with the Cabinet Secretary for Communities, Social Security and Equalities regarding how the 2018-19 budget can contribute to tackling child poverty. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. I meet all members of the Cabinet regularly to discuss how best to use the budget to deliver the Scottish Government's priorities of tackling inequalities and creating a more prosperous and fairer Scotland. The draft budget sets out a number of measures to tackle child poverty, including establishing a £50 million tackling child poverty fund, £8 million to fund the baby box, investment of £243 million towards providing expanded childcare eh, and supporting local authorities, including the Attainment Scotland Fund, as well as uh, that uh, commitment around uh, attainment of over £750 million. There's further housing investment as well. The first delivery plan due under the Child Poverty Scotland Act will be published in April and will set out a range of actions in this parliamentary term to make progress towards our ambitious targets to reduce child poverty. Jillian Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that findings from the Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland tell us that raising child benefit by £5 a week would lift 30,000 children out of poverty, something that Scottish Labour supports? And since the Scottish, budget, uh, Scottish Government has not included plans to specifically do this in their 2018-19 budget, can I ask specifically how the Scottish Government are then going to lift 30,000 children out of poverty? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I thought I was already able in uh, the first answer to set out some of the actions were taken. Further to that, there's another £100 million of welfare mitigation. I hear the point uh, that's made around top-ups to child benefit. We've asked the uh, Poverty and Inequality Commission uh, to provide advice on this and the sustainability and suitability of using that power. As it stands right now, it's estimated to cost around a quarter of a billion pounds every year. And as we understand it, only three pounds of every 10 would go to households in poverty if these proposals were implemented. So that's exactly why we've asked for more information for this to be explored. And I don't think with any credibility a member of the Labour Party can talk about an alternative budget when you realise that the revenue raising powers don't actually raise the revenue that's suggested. Question number five, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how many people in North Ayrshire will see their income tax rise uh, increase in 2018-19? Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Scottish income tax data and forecasts are not produced for local authority areas. Overall, however, 70% of Scottish taxpayers will pay less income tax in 1819 than they did this year for a given income. Nobody earning less than 33,000 will pay more in income tax next year. Jamie Green. Uh, in, in the absence of any answer, perhaps I can help the Cabinet Secretary out. Analysis of his tax plans show that up to 24,000 hard-working people in North Ayrshire will see their income tax rise this year. And contrary to what the First Minister said last week, uh, these are far from Scotland's richest and wealthiest. In fact, many will be deeply disappointed by this. Given that local SNP constituency, constituency members were elected in 2016 on a specific manifesto promise not to increase income tax, doesn't the Cab Cabinet Secretary and his colleagues owe people an apology for breaking that promise? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, we'll be investing more in public services. We'll be turning a Tory real terms cut to resource budgets into growth, including for the health service as well. And Jamie Green is one of these politicians that consistently demands more money be spent in his region, but of course also wants to raise less at the exact same time. Incidentally, the median salary in North Ayrshire is £23,352, which will show that just like the rest of the country, a majority of Scottish taxpayers will pay less, not more, under the tax plans that I've put forward. And of course, from some of the tax changes we've made, we'll invest in local government. Since North Ayrshire has been mentioned, they'll benefit from the deal with the Greens to the tune of overall uh, nationwide to local government £170 million, and North Ayrshire's figure is £4.2 million extra, opposed by Jamie Green. Ivan McKee. Thank you. I was going to ask the Cabinet Secretary how many people in my constituency of Glasgow Province will see their income tax reduced as a consequence of his budget, but clearly we don't have that data available at constituency level. I do, however, expect there will be far more winners than losers. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that injecting cash into lower income households will have a far greater impact on the economic multiplier effect as a consequence of those households having a higher propensity to consume, thus helping grow the Scottish economy? Cabinet yes, I do agree with that. The SFC have, have provided evidence uh, around that, as well as the modelling we produced for the discussion paper uh, last year uh, as well. So I think that's correct. And incidentally, uh, the issue around data is not Scottish Government's doing, but it's HMRC that actually collects income tax in Scotland. And if we want to see data enhancements, it will be for them to provide that either constituency or local authority analysis. James Kelly. Thank you. The recent figures from the uh, End Child Poverty Coalition report revealed that in North Ayrshire, nearly 30% of children are living in poverty, with that figure being as high as 36% in the Irvine West uh, ward. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that these figures are unacceptable? And rather than list, run, rhyming off a list of excuses uh, as to why he can't take action on child benefit, should he not be seriously looking at how to use the powers of the Parliament in order to alleviate these really concerning figures? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, I don't think those levels of poverty are actually acceptable, which is why we are taking a range of actions to tackle that. And we could do even more if we had welfare powers that we don't have. Uh, of course, Labour wasn't particularly supportive in getting them over the decades uh, that they had the opportunity to do so. And specifically in relation to Labour's propositions, I say again that the alternative budget put forward by the Labour Party is totally incredible. incredible. It doesn't stack up. It doesn't raise revenue and also calls on us to use powers and mechanisms that aren't currently in place. So yes, let's unite around tackling poverty, but let's do it in a credible way, which is exactly what this government proposes to do. Question number six, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the recent Guardian ICM survey, which suggests that 69% of people in Scotland support a referendum on the final terms of Brexit. Cabinet Secretary John Swain. Officer, the Guardian ICM survey provides further evidence that most voters in Scotland want to remain in the European Union. The Scottish Government recognises the arguments in favour of a second EU referendum, although it is not currently government policy. The Scottish Government believes it is vital that devolved administrations are involved in the negotiations by the UK with the European Union to ensure the interests of Scotland are protected. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful for that answer. For 18 months, I have heard this government demand that the democratic will of nearly 70% of the people of this country be recognised in the conduct of Brexit negotiations. Yet this government is completely silent in representing the views of nearly 70% of Scots who now support a referendum on the final terms of a Brexit deal. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that for every day which goes by when his government refuses to join calls for a referendum on the final deal, a day is lost in the efforts to offer the British people the opportunity to reverse one of the most calamitous decisions in the history of these islands? John Swinney. I, I agree with Mr Cole Hamilton about the calamitous nature of uh, the EU exit decision. Um, what the Scottish Government is doing is working very hard to try to ensure that we are able to influence the decisions taken by the United Kingdom Government in this respect, in their negotiating position. And there's two important dimensions to that. The first has been the evidence and arguments that the Scottish Government has marshalled to uh, support continued membership of the single market and the customs union, for which 
In my opinion, there is an, an, an unanswerable case has been made by the Scottish Government, but which has been cast aside by the, um, the, the illogical decisions of the United Kingdom Government. And secondly, we have been trying to uh, ensure the UK Government fulfils the commitments it made in the establishment of the Joint Ministerial Committee on European Negotiations, that the devolved administrations would be actively involved in the negotiations of the UK position. That has not happened. And indeed, today, UK ministers will be meeting to try to arrive at a final UK position. And the devolved administrations, not just the Scottish Government, but the devolved administrations as a whole, have not been involved in that process. So if the UK Government wants to be taken seriously about the conduct of these negotiations, they should respect the agreements that they have signed up to themselves and ensure that the devolved administrations are fully involved. Thank you very much. That concludes portfolio questions. We'll now move on to the